Hello, everyone. My name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to another episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I have a very special episode for you today, which I call the Top 20 Cases of Human Levitation. Yes, humans have the ability to fly. I know how that must sound to someone who's skeptical of this sort of thing, but the truth is, human levitation is very well documented. It's occurred all across our planet for more than a thousand years. There are many cases of nuns and monks levitating, saints and sorcerers, medicine men, holy people, witches, uh, normal people, yogis, many, many different accounts of human levitation all across our planet. And what I'd like to do is present what I think are the top 20 cases of people who have levitated. I'm gonna start with number 20 and go down to the number one best case of human levitation. So starting with number 20, I chose Angelo Faticoni. Throughout the 1920s, Angelo Faticoni of Jacksonville, Florida, publicly displayed his talent as the human cork. Without the use of any devices, Angelo, also known as the man they could not drown, was able to stay afloat in water indefinitely. He could assume virtually any position, lying on his side, his back, or curled up in a ball. He was even able to sleep on the water. He was able to swim great distances with metal weights tied to his body. During one experiment, he was observed to float in the water for a period of 15 hours with a 20-pound lead weight tied to his ankles. On another occasion, a 20-pound cannonball was lashed to his legs. He was then sewn into a sack and thrown into the water. Angelo remained motionless, floating on the surface of the water for a period of eight hours. Angelo's fame grew quickly, and he attracted more and more people who wanted to study his case. His abilities intrigued doctors at Harvard University who agreed to examine him. They theorized that a peculiarity in his physiology would account for his unnatural buoyancy. However, a thorough medical examination by doctors and students failed to reveal any physical abnormality. A photograph of one of the experiments shows Angelo floating in the water while tied to a weighted chair. His arms lay on his chest and his head rests just above the water with a calm expression on his face. According to Angelo, he acquired his ability as the result of a traumatic childhood incident. He often promised to reveal exactly how he became the human cork, but eventually, unfortunately, this was not to be. On August 13, 1931, the New York Herald Tribune announced the death of Angelo Faticoni with the headline, Human Cork is Dead, His Secret Unrevealed. So that's case number 20. It's not levitation in the sense of flying, but I think certainly is some sort of levitation and is very similar to the several accounts of people walking on water. The next case I'd like to talk about is case number 19, the case of Ted Owens. Born in 1924 in Bedford, Indiana, Ted Owens grew up in a family where psychic events were accepted and even encouraged. As a kid, he was very interested in the paranormal and often gave psychic readings to his friends. He first worked as a store clerk. Interested in learning more about psychic powers, however, he next worked with J.B. Ryan, a pioneer in psychic investigations. It was here that Ted first began to display powerful psychic abilities. After working with J.B. Ryan and showing these abilities, he quit and joined the U.S. Navy. And after that, he worked as a psychic and became very well known. He soon had a group of followers who helped support him, and he went on to experience numerous other kinds of paranormal events. He claimed to be able to control weather events, cause power outages, manipulate sporting events, and even call down UFOs. Uh, he would conduct spiritual healings, predict earthquakes, 
and many more unusual events. Uh, what's amazing about Ted Owens is he has a surprisingly strong track record of being accurate. As the number of his hits mounted, investigators were forced to take notice and study his case. One researcher who was impressed with Ted Owens is researcher Colin Wilson, who wrote, I think there seems to be no reasonable doubt that he had astonishing capacity for causing changes in the weather. Another researcher who looked into Ted's case was author Robert Mishlove, PhD, who documented many of these paranormal events and hundreds of other incidents in the life of Ted Owens in his outstanding book, The PK Man. Ted Owens also ended up writing his own book about his experiences in which he claimed that his powers came to him as the result of an extraterrestrial encounter during which he was given surgery and endowed with these psychic abilities. One paranormal event he experienced at least three times in his life includes levitation, and the first occurred at a very young age. As Ted Owens says, I was only four years old and was playing out in the yard. I was standing outside of the house when suddenly I began to float up the side of the house, way up to the top of the house. Then I floated back down again. Of course, back then, I had no idea of time, so I don't know how long it took, but I definitely floated up in the air. When I got back down again, I knocked on the door and told Queenie, his grandmother, about it, and she laughed and thought I was making it up. Ted's second levitation occurred when he was a young teenager, and unlike the first episode, this one involved an outside witness. As Ted says, I was about 13 years old. I was at the country club that was just outside of Bedford, where there was a swimming pool. It was in broad daylight. I climbed up on the 10-foot diving board, and I did a swan dive up into the air, spreading my arms out. But then I didn't come down. I was so astounded and amazed I couldn't believe it, but I kept my arms outstre outstretched, and it was the most wonderful, exhilarating feeling I've ever had in my life. I stayed up there for what seemed like a long time, then finally I went down into the water. I might have thought it was my imagination because I couldn't figure it out. I knew that what goes up comes down, but when I climbed out of the pool, Barb, Bob Armstrong came up, a redheaded kid with freckles, and he said to me, I knew you could do tricks, but how do you stay up in the air all that time? Ted had no explanation. He didn't know how this occurred. It was purely spontaneous. And it happened again. In 1943, at age 23, Ted experienced his third and final episode of levitation. At this time, he was in the U.S. Navy aboard a ship in the Pacific. On this occasion, there were scores of witnesses. As Ted says, one day, I was outside on the ship's deck. I climbed up on a hatch. There must have been 50 to 60 men up there, lying around, looking at the ocean. I gave a little jump to go down two or three feet off the hatch, and instead of coming down, I went into the air and just sort of floated. All of the sailors were pointing and saying, Look! Look at that! I was just floating and finally came down near the rail some distance away. It was really weird. I'll never forget it. It was definitely a levitation, but I don't know what caused it. The sailor's eyes were all bulging out. I lost all sense of time, just as I had done when it happened in Bedford. Regarding these levitation events, Mishlove writes, Admittedly, these accounts of spontaneous levitation stretch Owens's credibility. This is probably because such a phenomenon is extremely rare but it is not unknown in the annals of psychic science. If the great saints could levitate, there is no logical reason to doubt that some of us living secular lives could similarly be endowed with the same ability. Ted Owens died on December 28, 1987, leaving behind an enduring legacy of mystery. So that's case number 19, and that one involves a seemingly normal gentleman who, although was gifted with psychic abilities. And there are many, many other cases. A truly astonishing case is number 18, 
involving a yogi by the name of Luang Pu Win. Uh, this event occurred in 1971 near the Mei Pang Mountain in Thailand. Lu, Luang Pu Win was born in 1887 and began his religious studies at age 12, soon became an ordained monk specializing in the Sayawet or magical knowledge and practices originally formulated by Indian Brahmins. Wien soon gained a reputation in the area for being able to chase away wild animals that were terrorizing local villages. But it's his levitations which really caused a lot of attention. In 1971, a Royal Thai Air Force pilot received the shock of his life. During a practice flight, he clearly saw the form of a monk sitting in serene meditation on a cloud. The pilot was forced to swerve to avoid a collision, and later he identified the monk as Luang Pu Win. According to Win's biographer, Stanley Javarja Tambia, several other pilots had the same experience and also traveled to Wien's monastery to identify him as the one they saw levitating several thousand feet in the air, which might be the single highest recorded levitation in history. Although he didn't like fame, this incident did make him the, the most popular monk of Thailand in that decade. He attracted the royal patr patronage and King Bum Bu Mipol of Thailand became a close devotee of this monk. In the latter period of his life, the abbot of his resident monastery had to limit and control the number of people who came to visit Luang Po Wain. Uh, he was very popular and crowds just came to visit and talk to him. One day, a doctor got the rare chance to ask the monk about this incident involving the Air Force pilot. And Luang Pu Wien's response was, do you think I'm a bird? So he didn't really want to talk about it. Luang Pu Wien lived to the age of 98 years and died in 1985. It's an incredible case, but certainly not unique. Case number 17, I chose the experiments of Sven Turk. Sven Turk conducted some remarkable levitation experiments in the mid 1940s in Copenhagen, Denmark. Sven Turk was a psychical researcher and a professional photographer, and he headed a project which had the specific goal of photographing levitation. As Sven Turk writes, I subjected most of our mediums here in Copenhagen to critical investigation and afterwards organized a little group of 10 members of the highest capacities. We got together twice weekly at my laboratory in Vesterbro. Our intent was to make a completely technical attempt to bring about telekinesis and levitation, two groups of phenomena which are well suited to photographing. The first few sessions produced few results. However, as the meetings progressed, the phenomenon began to grow in strength, and after several months of regular meetings with these mediums, the group had successfully levitated several heavy pieces of furniture, and they were able to record these events on a trio of cameras that they had placed at strategic locations to capture any activity. After one year of experimenting, the group finally succeeded in levitating a human being. During one of these sessions, one of the members of the group, a Mr. Borg Nicholson, suddenly found himself rising up to the ceiling. As Sven Turk writes, he circled around up there above the table and fell to the knees of Madame Maloney, softly, without the least bump. Madame Maloney scarcely felt the force of his fall. The three cameras had flashed and presented us with proof that we had not been the victims of a hallucination. I succeeded in photographing five such air rides. 
Well-known psychic medium Olaf Johnson was a member of Sven Turk's group, and as Olaf writes, big heavy tables lifted themselves to the ceiling in spite of several persons on board as passengers. One medium who sat in our group was named Mickelson, and he was able to bring about veritable flights to the ceiling. Sven Turk's experiments, and especially his photographs, sent shockwaves through Denmark's scientific community. As psychic researcher Brad Steiger writes, who interviewed and wrote the autobiography of Olaf Johnson, the series of photographs taken during Turk's experiments in Copenhagen were carefully examined by five of Denmark's foremost photographic technicians, among them the director of the Danish phot Photographic Professional School, Theodor Andresen, who had full access to the photographic negatives. Each of the photographers agreed that no manipulations whatsoever had been worked upon with the negatives. So yeah, that's case number 17, and it involves numerous levitations, some of which were actually photographed. Very good evidence. The next case I want to talk about is case number 16, and that involves St. Catherine of Siena, a very well-known saint. St. Catherine of Siena was born in 1347 and was an extremely influential spiritual leader. She gave counsel to popes, princes, priests, soldiers, and the common man. She was credited with helping to heal the Great Schism, which had divided the Western Church for 40 years. And when the Black Death swept across Europe, she became famous for caring for the sick and dying, and often treated those who nobody else would help or touch, including victims of leprosy. St. Catherine was the 23rd child in her family and devoted her life to spirituality from age 6 when she had a vision of the Lord. By age 12, she built a hermitage in her backyard and around that time started to fall into ecstatic trances and would feel herself levitated until her head hit the ceiling. Her parents tried everything they could do to dissuade her from her religious obsessions, but it was no use. They finally gave up and gave Catherine her own small room in which she spent most of her time praying intensely. She also fasted and slept on hard wooden boards. This is a process known as asceticism. As an adult, St. Catherine continued to have regular mystical experiences usually following communion or her practice of depriving herself of food, sleep, and comfort. Her numerous levitations were often witnessed by her fellow nuns who verified the miracles by placing their hands between the floor and the floating Catherine. Her biographer, Jorgensen, gives a vivid description of one of Catherine's levitations. As he writes, Beginning to pray, she found herself in a new and strange state where everything disappeared around her and she had the feeling of hovering in a world of bright light. She had the impression of being lifted up little by little from the ground, higher and higher. Finally, her head hit the ceiling, which woke her. On August 18, 1370, following communion, Catherine remained levitated above her bed, which was witnessed by three people. One of the witnesses to this reports that her levitations sometimes exceeded several meters. Olivier Leroy, who wrote one of the first books on human levitation, considered St. Catherine's case to be particularly reputable. Another researcher, Herbert Thurston, wrote that the evidence for St. Catherine of Siena's levitations seems quite overwhelming. During her ecstasies, Catherine occasionally gave long spiritual discourses, much in the manner of today's trance channelers. Many of these discourses were later published as the Dialogues of St. Catherine and are today considered spiritual classics. Interesting here are the comments Catherine made regarding levitation. Like many channelers, Catherine spoke 
as if she were channeling God. As St. Catherine says in her own words, the perfect soul lives in constant union with God. Many times the body is raised from the ground because of this perfect union that the soul has made with me, as if the body had lost its weight in order to become light. Actually, it lost none of its weight, but as the union of the soul with me is more perfect than the union between the body and the soul, the force of the spirit fixed in me raises the weight of the body from the ground. Catherine of Siena died at age 33 and was canonized as a saint in 1461, and her case remains one of the best verified cases of human levitation. And now we move to case 15. For case 15, I chose a young gentleman by the name of Indridi Indridison, who became Iceland's most famous medium. Indridi was born in 1883. By 1905, at age 12, Indridi created a furor in his home when a poltergeist repeatedly pulled him out of bed and threw objects around in his presence. This activity began shortly after he attended a seance during which he displayed unusually strong physical mediumistic abilities. Soon, this haunting activity escalated to the point where Indridi himself began to levitate. One memorable incident occurred when he was dressing himself in his bedroom. Finding himself flying uncontrollably through the air, he screamed for help. His guardian, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Thorlikson, came running and saw Indridi in full levitation. As Mr. Thorlikson writes, Indridi is lying in the air in a horizontal position at about the height of my chest and swaying there to and fro with his feet pointing towards the window, and it seems to me that the invisible power that is holding him in the air is trying to swing him out the window. I don't hesitate a moment, but grab the medium and push him down onto the bed and hold him there. But then I notice that both of us are being lifted up. Mr. Thorlikson screamed for help, and another member of the household came running in, and the two men together were just barely able to hold this young boy and pull him back onto the bed. So at this point, Indridi realized that something very, very strange and profound was happening to him, and he agreed to sit at further seances. His abilities quickly grew in strength, and he became Iceland's single most influential psychic medium, producing the entire range of physical mediumship phenomena, including powerful levitations. And in fact, during his early levitations, he rose so quickly that his head often struck the ceiling. Sometimes during seances, Indridi himself would not only levitate, but so would the chair or the couch on which he sat, sometimes several feet into the air. Indridi was usually only able to levitate in darkness or near darkness, so scientists had to use elaborate and clever controls to verify his levitations. As one researcher uh, wrote, Professor Nielsen, uh, he was a prominent preacher who studied the case, writes Nielsen, in order to substantiate these phenomena, we placed him in a basket chair which creaked conveniently upon the least movement. We placed this at one end of the room and tight rows of chairs all across the room so that any passage between the chairs was impossible. Then the sitters, and it must be remembered that we were sometimes more than 50 or more in number, all sat down in the chairs, the light being put out. Very soon, the medium was levitated in the basket chair at a great distance from the floor, creaking in the chair being heard while it glided above our heads and was rather noisily deposited on the floor behind the chairs. The light was immediately lit, and there sat the medium, unconscious, in a deep trance in the chair. Indridi also uh, displayed a number of other abilities, including something known as supernatural agility. He was able to perform complex gymnastic feats while in a trance. A professional gymnastic instructor from Iceland, a gentleman by the name of Olafur 
Rosencrantz verified these feats and reported that they were well beyond his own considerable abil abilities. Indridi was able to perform these supernatural agility feats in bright light. So this caused a lot of attention to be put towards him and numerous scientists and high level officials examined Indridi, including a future Supreme Court judge uh, and Halgrimir Svensson, the Bishop of Iceland. One prominent scientist was Dr. Gumindir Hansen, a physician and the founder of Icelandic Scientific Society and president of the University of Iceland. Gudmundur was present during several of Indridi's levitations, during which the medium was drawn up into the air with his feet turned towards the ceiling and his head downwards. At that time, the medium's hands were held by another man who reported that Indridi was levitated with such force that he was barely able to hold onto his hands. This happened on many occasions, and as the witness said, I myself, while continuing to hold the medium, was thrown with him into the air so that we crashed to the floor violently. In his notes on the various seances with Indridi, Gundmundir Hansen remarked upon several other levitations of, the, of Indridi. Of one instance he wrote, the medium's chair levitated a few times, but not with so much force that it could not be held down with one hand. Damage or a scratch from the medium's chair in the corner indicates that the chair is levitated at least 35 centimeters. On January 18, 1909, uh, one of the researchers, a man by the name of Mr. Nielsen, was present when Indridi experienced a levitation during a seance in a darkened room. And as Mr. Nielsen writes, this time I and two others remained alone by the medium in a kind of semi-trance. He said, where are you taking me? A little later, we three heard his voice coming from close to the ceiling. Next, all three of us clearly heard the medium being drawn along the ceiling of the room and made to knock his fingers on it. After a while, he was taken down and we asked for the light. He was lying on the table, still being in a trance. During another seance, Mr. Thorlikson asked if the spirits were able to levitate him personally. And as Mr. Thorlikson writes, immediately, just as I finished the last word, I felt as if something covered me completely, but did not grasp me in any particular part of my body. At the same moment, I crashed down on the floor on my hands and feet. This happened at such lightning speed that I had no time to realize the route. I had no awareness until I fell down on the floor. Later, Dr. Loftur Gesursen and Dr. Erlinder Haraldsson of Reykjavik later studied Indridi's case in minute detail and actually wrote a book about it. Concerning his levitations, they write, Levitation of a human body has sometimes been observed at seances of various celebrated mediums, but such reports have often been hotly debated. Indridi's levitations must be considered an important addition to these reports. Indridi died in 1912 at the very young age of 29. It's an incredible case and only one of, again, many, many reports. Many of the cases of well-verified levitations involve psychic mediums, and often these do occur in low light levels or in darkness, uh, but scientists are able to use very ingenious methods to verify them. Another such case is case number 14, involving a young Austrian medium by the name of Willy Schneider. This case comes from psychical researcher Baron Albert von Schrenk Natzing, who lived from 1862 to 1929. And Baron Albert Schrenk Natzing was a German aristocrat and a prominent physician. 
and he used his considerable wealth and influence to undertake a series of well-controlled scientific experiments with the leading physical mediums of his era, including Willy Schneider and his younger brother, Rudy. Schrenk-Natzing's rigidly controlled experiments with Willy Schneider in particular created a shockwave among local scientists, and prominent among these were Professor Holub, Professor Burse, and Dr. Gele, and the well-known writer Hans Müller, all of who conceded that Schrenk-Natzing's experiments with Willy Schneider have proven that levitation is a true fact. Schrenk Natzing's approach to the subject was only part of what made his experiments so popular. The other reason was because his experiments actually worked time after time under very controlled laboratory conditions. Schrenk Natzing and his associates were able to provoke levitations in Willy Schneider. As one of the witnesses to these experiments writes, Schneider rose horizontally and seemed to rest on an invisible cloud. He ascended to the ceiling and remained five minutes suspended there, moving his legs about rhythmically. The descent was as sudden as the uplifting. The supervision had been perfect. Dr. Gillet, in his last journey to Vienna, also witnessed the levitation of Willie at Dr. Holub's and he told me he felt absolutely sure of the genuineness of the phenomena. Because these levitations only took place in red light or near total darkness, Schrenk Natzing ingeniously stitched Schneider's clothes with phosphorescent pins, thereby allowing the witnesses to carefully observe Schneider's movements. And by 1927, Baron Schrenk Natzing had recorded no less than 27 separate levitations of Willy Schneider in front of numerous reputable witnesses. As leading paranormal researcher Nander Fodor writes, the conditions of these experiments were very strict and the records unimpeachable. An electrical system of control made the phenomenon fraud proof. The best evidence of this is the statement of a hundred profoundly skeptical and often hostile scientists who witnessed the phenomenon in 1922 and declared themselves completely convinced. Uh, here, Baron Schrenk Natzing describes the process involved in the levitations. As Schrenk Natzing says, Willie gradually entered into an auto-hypnosis state accompanied by a very rapid contraction of his body as if the subject was suddenly frightened. Often the passage to this state of somnambulism was so rapid that Willie didn't have time to finish the sentence he began. Sometimes when the medium wakes up, he continues the sentence and the conversation he began when he was awake. One has the impression that a strange and irresistible force takes control of the young man. The bodily state changes all of a sudden. The muscles will sh before where in a state of normal tension become hypertonic and rigid, producing clonic jerks in the arms, and, and the spasm's amplitude increases regularly before the appearance of the phenomenon. His entire body was agitated, run through with cramps, and often the medium jumped from his chair and groaned like a man who wanted to lift a heavy weight. Schneider's levitations usually began vertically. Uh, once a height of about five feet was reached, his body would suddenly swing to a horizontal position and move back and forth about 10 feet. And the duration of the levitations was generally about 30 seconds. Interestingly, Willie Schneider lost his ability to levitate after going through puberty. His younger brother, Rudy, also showed similar abilities, though in a less spectacular fashion. And another curious detail was that the levitations were most successful when the group of sitters in the seance numbered about 10 people and were evenly divided between men and women. Baron Schrenk-Natzing continued to 
continued his influential experiments until his death at the age of 67. And afterwards, both brothers continued to work as mediums into adulthood. Uh, at this time, there were some allegations of fraud, but nobody has been able to debunk the original experiments by Schwenk Natzing involving the levitation of Willy Schneider in particular. So it's an excellent case, and I think is a wonderful example of how this phenomena has been proven in a laboratory setting, uh, proven enough to make many skeptical scientists declare that levitation is a reality. A truly astonishing case is what I, the case I chose for number 13. And this is the case involving Saint Padre Pio. Padre Pio was born in 1887 in Benevento, Italy. He joined the Franciscans at age 17, and at age 21, he began to experience terrible pains in his hands and feet, which doctors were unable to diagnose. Three years later, Padre Pio collapsed from the pain, and his fellow priests found him unconscious, bleeding from the hands and feet. Pio had become what we now know as a stigmatic, someone who displays the wounds of Jesus Christ uh, on the cross, bleeding from the hands and feet. Following this, Padre Pio began to perform a number of very well-verified miraculous healings, including healing a girl of blindness, another man of blindness, several people of cancer, a man of paralysis, to name just a few of the many healings he performed. And that's not all. There is a astonishingly, astonishingly wide variety of miracles attributed to Padre Pio. He provided all kinds of prophecies. And for example, he predicted in 1947 that Pope John Paul would be the second, would become the next Pope. Padre Pio often had visions of angels and says that he was also um, often attacked by demonic spirits who would assault him and leave all kinds of bruises and uh, all over his body. Padre Pio always remained uh, in his uh, location in Italy but what was really interesting is he was often seen all over the world in various cities. And he, people started to realize that Padre Pio had the ability of bi-location. He could be in more than one place at once, uh, which he would do to administer to the poor and the needy. Uh, he reportedly was able to give accurate details about people's lives, people he had never met, and would often counsel them and tell them all about their lives and give them very powerful spiritual advice. On one occasion, he was able to rid an orchard of terrible pests and actually cause this orchard to bloom. Uh, he also reportedly emitted a flowery scent. This is what uh, we know as the odor of sanctity, which is reported in many saints, but also reported with uh, St. Padre Pio. So the list of paranormal events surrounding this man number in the many hundreds and are very well verified. And some of these accounts involve levitation. Uh, one witness to a levitation was Padre Ascanio, who writes, we were waiting for Padre Pio, who was coming to hear confession of his penitence. The church was crowded and everybody watched the door through which Padre Pio would enter. The door stays closed, but suddenly I saw Father Pio walking above the heads of the people. He reached the confessional and then disappeared. After some minutes, he started to receive the penitence. Padre Ascanio later approached Pio and asked him how he was able to walk in the air. Padre Pio responded, I can assure you, my child, it's just like walking on the floor. Padre Pio also had the ability of multiplication of food. Uh, he once walked into his chambers and came out with a handful of loaves of bread, 
which by all accounts had not been in there uh, before he walked in and used these to feed the poor. Another amazing levitation event occurred during World War II. Uh, the American commanding officer for the United States was leading a squadron of bombardiers to destroy German war materials. Uh, and this was at the San Giovanni Rotunda, situated near the monastery where Padre Pio resided. Two of the American pilots were at the point of triggering the mission when they saw Padre Pio floating before them in the air, admonishing them to turn around. Uh, these bombs, uh, which should have destroyed the Rotondo, released themselves without any serious effects. They fell into the woods and apparently did not go off. And uh, the airplanes turned around, or the pilots turned around, uh, and reversed their direction from this area. Uh, court, reportedly, the pilots had no manual control over the aircraft. So word of this event spread quickly, and uh, it was reported that uh, Padre Pio had saved the San Giovanni Monastery from destruction. So uh, one of these pilots, a general, went to the monastery to see if he could find this monk that uh, he had seen floating uh, next to his plane. And he went to the monastery and was looking at the various monks and found Padre Pio and recognized him instantly. At that point, Padre Pio walked toward him. And as he approached him, uh, Padre Pio said, are you the one who wanted to kill all of us? And relieved by the look of Padre Pio and the words of the father, the general knelt humbly in front of him. And as Padre Pio usually did, he spoke in his own language but the general was convinced uh, Padre Pio had spoken in English. This was apparently another one of Padre Pio's amazing abilities. He could make himself understood to anyone, regardless of the language they spoke. Uh, the general was so impressed by meeting with Padre Pio that he changed his religion from Protestant to Catholic. Uh, this is an incredible modern case of human levitation. Padre Pio died in 1968 and was canonized in 2002 as a saint. Another truly astonishing and well-verified case is the case I chose for number 12 involving a young girl by the name of Janet Hodgson. Uh, she also went under the pseudonym of Janet Harper uh, initially. Uh, this case is particularly compelling because the phenomena surrounding her was observed by so many people. It occurred in modern times. Uh, many people actually saw her levitation and provided first-hand testimonials. And uh, she herself also talked about what it was like to levitate. And finally, and most amazingly, uh, some of her levitations were actually photographed. Uh, this case is known as the Enfield Haunting, and it began in 1977 when the Hodgson family uh, suddenly and without warn any warning uh, realized that their house was severely haunted. Violent poltergeist activity seemed to center around one of their three children, Janet Hodgson, who was just entering puberty. The haunting started out innocuously with small objects moving, doors opening and closing, and little things like this. However, it soon escalated to furniture being tumbled around and objects thrown at people's faces. Uh, this activity was very brazen, uh, very public, and the activity was photographed and, num photographed and witnessed by numerous credible observers, including scientists and police officers and psychic investigators. One year later, in 1978, Janet began to fall into trances. She was rushed to the hospital, but doctors were unable to diagnose these trance states, and that's when she started to levitate. The levitations began when Janet and her sister Rose 
started to get thrown out of bed by an unseen force, and this soon escalated into levitations, which often occurred when Janet was asleep. Uh, while asleep, Janet would repeatedly float out of bed across the room and be deposited on a dresser where she would wake up with no knowledge of how she got there. By this time, investigators were on the scene uh, nearly constantly and were documenting the activity as it occurred. Janet kept getting pulled out of bed. On one occasion, she was floated asleep into the corner of the room, a distance of more than 14 feet. On another occasion, Janet was actually awake during a levitation. She walked next door, knocked on the neighbor's door, which opened by itself, and as Janet says in her own words, Peggy's front door opened on its own. I looked behind, and there was no one there, and it just shut. I looked in the front room, and no one's in there. When I came in, someone lifted me upstairs. I got lifted halfway up the stairs, and I came rolling down. I nearly found dead when that happened. It frightened the life out of me. A few days later, it happened again. Janet woke up out of a sound sleep and was levitated or dragged down the staircase. As Janet says, I was in bed asleep when all of a sudden I felt something pull me by the arms out of bed. And I tripped over and I went there. And it lifted me up and the door opened and I went flying downstairs. Janet's mother observed this incident and as she says, I saw the door open. It seemed as if she was being pulled along the floor. Investigator Maurice Gross was also there and caught the tail end of the incident and saw Janet lying head downwards on the staircase, slowly sliding down it, still half asleep. By this point, the activity was escalating to a fever pitch and the investigators were actually able to engage the poltergeist in communication, first through automatic writing and then by using direct channeling through Janet. And many of these uh, voice recordings, these conversations, were recorded on audio tape. And during one such uh, incident, the investigators asked the poltergeist, will you do some tricks for us? Leave the room, the spirit said through Janet. So the investigators left the room and Janet suddenly called out, I'm being levitated. There was a loud crash as the investigators found that the mattress had been flung across the room, blocking the doorway. Although the investigators didn't actually witness this levitation, they could see that Janet herself was convinced. She had a total, a look of total astonishment and just kept repeating, I've been floating in the air. I've just been floating. Uh, investigators were intrigued and they were determined to get proof. And a few days later, Janet reported that she had been levitated and pulled through a solid wall into the adjoining bedroom. As she says, I was sitting on the bed and I sort of sprang into the air and started whizzing around the room. Then I went through the wall. Uh, that may sound amazing, but it's not the only case of someone moving through a solid wall. So it wasn't long before other people began to witness Janet's levitations, and one such witness was Hazel Short, a neighbor who looked inside Janet's bedroom uh, from the sidewalk outside the house and saw her floating. As Hazel Short says in her own words, I was standing there looking at the house when all of a sudden a couple of books came flying across and hit the window. It was so sudden. I heard the noise because it was so quiet, and then after a while, I saw Janet. She was going up and down as though someone was just tossing her up and down bodily in a horizontal position, as if someone had got a hold of her legs and back and was throwing her up and down. I definitely saw her come up to window height, but I thought if she was bouncing, she'd bounce from her feet. She wouldn't be able to get enough power to bounce off her back to come up that high. My friend could see her as well, and we both could see her. It was as though her arms and legs were going everywhere. I mean, if you were doing it to yourself, you'd definitely keep your arms and legs to your body, if you know what I mean. But she was definitely lying horizontal, coming up and down. Another witness was so upset, he insisted upon being anonymous, but he did give a first-hand testimony of what he saw. As he says, I saw this child, whom I now know to be Janet, well inside the room, 
and in the first instance I saw her head bobbing up and down, just as if she were bouncing up and down on her bed. But then articles came swiftly across the room towards the window. They were definitely not thrown at the window as the articles were going round and round in a circle, hitting the window and then bouncing off to continue at the same height in a clockwise direction. These articles appeared to be books, dolls, and linens. There were five or six articles, and by their movement, they acted as though they were attached to a piece of elastic. They appeared to be traveling with considerable force and were going around at the same time. The child then appeared on two occasions, floating horizontally across the room, and twice her arm banged forcibly against the window. I was frightened at the time that she would come right through the window. At the same time as the articles were going around the room, the curtains were blowing upward into the room. I was very upset and disturbed by what I saw. So investigators at this point decided to set up a remote control camera in an attempt to catch Janet's levitations on film. And to their amazement, they succeeded in getting several clear photos of Janet levitating in the center of her room. One particularly impressive photo shows Janet hovering in a kneeling position in midair in the center of the room, leaning forward with her arms outstretched in front of her. In the background, you can see her sister looking on in a stunned amazement. So this was a very famous case, which attracted a lot of attention. Uh, it was published in newspapers. Crowds of people came to watch the haunting activity. Police were called on numerous occasions. It was investigated by many paranormal researchers. One researcher, Guy Lyon Playfair, wrote a book about this case entitled, This house is haunted. Uh, many years later, um, there was a TV series uh, which presented this case in detail, a dramatization, and uh, Janet Hodgson herself uh, gave an interview, and uh, she says, I know it happened, and I know it was real. So it's a really amazing case of human levitation which was observed by multiple witnesses and also captured on film. And now we get to case number 11, which I call the Levitation Experiments of Hereward Carrington. Hereward Carrington was a prominent and pioneering psychic, psychical researcher, and he decided to do some research into human levitation. Uh, he used an ingenious and yet simple experiment uh, which he designed, and it involves the use of breathing and the common schoolyard game known as finger levitation. Hereward Carrington's repeated experiments prove conclusively that rhythmic breathing can in fact reduce the weight of a human body. This experiment involved five people, a wooden chair, and a very large sized self-registering weight scale. Uh, the wooden chair was placed in the center of the scale and one person sat on it. The other four people also stood on the scale on each side of the person sitting in the chair. And at this point, their combined weight, including the chair, measured exactly 712 pounds. Then under Hereward Carrington's instructions, all five people were instructed to inhale and exhale deeply several times in unison. And on the fifth count, everyone was instructed to retain their breath and the four lifters would then quickly insert their fingers beneath the arms and legs of the sitter and lift him up with their fingers. To Carrington's shock and delight, he was able to scientifically prove that levitation was occurring. As he writes, and I quote, on the first lift, the recorder stated that the dial had fallen to 660 pounds, a loss of 52 pounds. On the second lift, there was an apparent loss of 52 pounds. On the third lift of 60 pounds, and on the fourth lift, 60 pounds, and on the fifth lift, 60 pounds. No gain of weight was at any time recorded, invariably a loss, which, however, slowly returned to normal as the subject was held for some considerable time in the air. 
I have no theory to offer as to these observations, which I cannot fully explain. So yes, human levitation has been proven repeatedly in a laboratory setting, and Hereward Carrington's experiments are among the best. As researcher Nander Fodor writes, Hereward Carrington's experiments with the lifting game, finger levitation, have actually proved that for some mysterious reason, rhythmical breathing may considerably reduce the weight of the human body. Amazing. So many cases of human levitation. All right, those are the top 20 best cases of human levitation, part one. I had to break this episode up into two parts because it was just getting way too long. So I want to thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to stay tuned for next week when I present the top 20 cases of human levitation, part two, which will be cases 10 through one. Until then, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and keep having fun.